Ian Underwood has been a planetary scientist and artificial intelligence researcher at NASA, a certified hypnotherapist, a fourth generation Wing Chun Sifu, and the director of Ask Dr. Math, a founding owner of the Bardo Project and Shaolin Rifle Works, and a public speaker. When he grows up, he wants to create a line of educational comic books. Please join me in welcoming Ian Underwood. Hi, thanks. Is this uh, loud enough? I can move it. Move it, move it. Okay. Um, so the talk, the title of my talk is uh, basically how I found religion and then lost it again. Um, and the elevator version of the speech is that when I was young, um, I wanted to understand what it was like to be religious, right? And I, it's hard for, that, for anybody to explain to you what that's like. It's sort of like trying to explain what chocolate tastes like. If you've never tasted it, how can you actually say what it is? Um, and then what happened is I actually became religious, but I didn't know it. <laughs> and I'll explain how that's possible. And then I became unreligious again. And again, I didn't really realize it until I was looking back. Um, and looking back, I realized that my religion had been liberty and that my salvation had been mathematics. Um, and in this process, I learned some things that I think might be interesting, which I'm going to share today. So the story starts here, northern Indiana, Porter County. It's basically a suburb of Chicago. Um, we have Chicago TV, Chicago newspapers, everything in Chicago. It's the only part of the state that went on daylight savings time so that it would stay with Chicago. The rest of the state was sort of... Um, you know, and, and for purposes of this talk, the, the important thing is that there were no guns, right? This is part of Chicago, basically. Nobody, had, nobody I knew had a gun. Nobody talked about guns. You just saw them on TV and in movies. So that's what I knew about them, which is to say nothing at all. So as I said, I, I had a friend who was just a, an exceptional person, one of the most exceptional people I've ever met. She was thoughtful, articulate, clear thinking, and she was Catholic. Um, and I just couldn't, you know, I used to talk to her about this, like, what is the deal? How can you do this? How can you just have an idea in your head and just believe it, you know, without any justification, without any arguments, anything? And, and again, she was never able to explain that to me. So I didn't really get an answer, and I just filed that away. Um, you know, in the back of my mind is a question to be answered someday. So I graduated with a degree in mathematics. Whoops. So I graduated with a degree in mathematics, which meant that I wasn't really qualified to do anything useful. So I ended up in the space program, which is daycare for scientists and mathematicians. <laughs> um, so I was at JPL Caltech, which is where the, we do the uh, unmanned space program. I, what I did was actually planetary geometry, which is figuring out, using math to figure out if I have a spacecraft flying past a planet and I take a measurement, what did I measure? <laughs> Where was I? Where was it pointed? What should I be expecting? And, and so on. Um, so sometime during this period, there was a mass shooting, right? And I remember having this thought, which was, if I were ever, was ever in a situation where there was a mass shooting and, like, say, the, the gun got knocked and, and kicked over me and I picked it up, I would have not clue one about what to do. I wouldn't know how to point it, I wouldn't know how to shoot it, I wouldn't know how to unload it, I wouldn't know what to do. And I thought, that's a really stupid thing not to know. At this time, coincidentally, the Pasadena police offered a course for JPL employees on the JPL campus about gun safety. So I'm like, hey, okay, this is Providence. So I went to the course, we spent a, a couple of nights after work, and they showed us all the different kinds of uh, firearms, how to load and unload them, how to be safe, and for, uh, the, the final part, there was a range day where it turns out up in the hills behind the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, this is in Pasadena, California, there's a shooting range. Who knew? So we went up there and we just shot some revolvers and I came away with a few lessons there. One of them was, this is nothing like movies and TV, right? I mean, just hitting anything, let alone when nothing's moving and nobody's shooting back. Um, the second thing was, these aren't so bad. I could be safe around these. I might own one of these someday. And the third thing was, this could actually be a lot of fun. <laughs> um, so um, that was Southern California. I moved back to Evanston, Illinois for graduate school. No guns there. I met my wife, Jody. 
moved out to the Bay Area, no guns there. We moved to Israel so she could work on her PhD. Guns everywhere. I mean everywhere, just you're walking around and anybody who's, not just the soldiers with guns, I mean just people walking around with Mexican carry, just guns tucked in their pants, okay? And in fact, um, the schools there, there has to be an armed teacher for every 20 students. That's actually the law. So it's sort of interesting that we got used to this idea of just having guns everywhere. It didn't make us feel unsafe. And in fact, it's sort of like you think you're in a convenience store. It's like there is no way this place is getting robbed, right? Not going to happen. Um, oh, there was a, a phrase that they used that we learned and we really like. Um, when you would walk into some place like a mall, somebody, a security guard would lean over and he'd say, yes, neshek, which means, do you have a weapon? And you'd just say no, and they're like, okay. <laughs> right? That was what they had instead of metal detectors. Um, so she finished her PhD, she gets a, uh, Jody gets a, a job, a postdoc at Vanderbilt. We moved to Tennessee, as they say, the patron state of shooting stuff. Now there's guns everywhere. Now around this time, the Long Island Railroad shooting had happened, and I used that as a way to trick Jody into taking a concealed carry course, right? Yeah. Sort of the same argument, right? What if we were in that situation and this happened? How dumb would that be, right? To not know what to do. So we went, we took the course. Um, it turns out she's a natural, she's a great shot. We were enjoying it. We had a friend who said we could shoot for free on his land. Um, and so we bought our first gun, a Colt revolver. It was great, we're having fun. We bought our second gun, a CZ-75, and this is where the fun begins. Because if you know, CZ-75 takes a 15 round magazine. So I went to try to buy some extra 15 round magazines. I was told, well, you can't have any unless they were manufactured before 1994. And I'm like, okay, first of all, no. And second, what difference does it make when it's manufactured? And third, what do you think I'm gonna do with this thing? You know, I've been a model citizen my whole life. What is it that, that suddenly I'm a potential criminal? Um, I'm not keeping up with the slide. So at this point, um, it's okay, there's, they're just little visuals. So at this point, I start reading, and I start reading a lot of the things that you guys have all read, right? The Declaration, the Constitution, um, the Federalist Papers, John Ross, Ayn Rand, L. Neil Smith, uh, Bastiat, Hayek, Spooner, and so on, right? So you're all familiar with these. So I'm just devouring this stuff, and I'm reading it, and there's a question in the back of my mind, another question back there, which is, what's the proper relationship between a citizen and government? And what's interesting to me now, looking back, is the way I phrase that to myself, the proper relationship, as if there's only one. So, mostly I followed her around. Um, she got a job at Educational Testing Service in New Jersey. And by this time, you know, we're shooters, or at least I'm a shooter, and she's good at it. She doesn't have to practice. Um, and so there's no way that we are living in New Jersey. Not happening. So we're looking around, how close can we live to New Jersey and not actually be in it? So we found Bucks County. We got a place which is about a par five from the Delaware River. So she had an easy commute. Um, and I was working from home on a job that I had gotten when we were in Israel. And so what I started doing with all my free time was arguing, right? Just getting on the internet. Um, we didn't have Facebook then. This is Usenet. Anybody remember Usenet? Yeah. I, I miss using that, actually. Um, so I start arguing, and it's like, I'm articulate, I write well, I've been explaining things all my life, I am going to be Buddha's one candle that lights a thousand others. I am going to straighten these people out and get people to understand what it is they're not seeing, right? And I'm talking mostly about guns, but really always talking about liberty. Um, and so, you know, I've, a lot of you have probably gone through the same thing. You're sitting there, you're like, how, how do you not see this? It is so clear. It is so obvious. And finally, you, you conclude, are you just too stupid to follow a logical argument? Um, and so, you know, <laughs> well, that's actually, it, it's what you end up thinking. And so, you know, I got tired of casting my pearls before swine, just went back to my life. You know, just really stopped even trying to convince people of anything. Now, at that time, by then, my life was running a site, first for Swarthmore College and then for Drexel University called Ask Dr. Math. And this is a site, it's, it's like a little miracle. We have hundreds of volunteers all over the world, and what they do is they come to the site, 
people come to the site and ask questions about math, any questions. It could be a third grader asking about, you know, triangles and squares. It could be a graduate student trying to solve a theorem that nobody's ever proved, you know, prove a theorem nobody's ever proved. It could be a guy trying to build a doghouse, right? We don't care. So um, what happened then is there's a saying that people always tell you you don't understand anything until you teach it, right? This is where I found that out. I had a degree in mathematics. I had worked at NASA every day for seven years using math. I didn't have a clue. I really didn't understand what it was about, you know? Um, now, what was interesting, though, is it felt a little bit the same. Here I am again. This is all over the internet. It's all in email, basically. And so I'm sitting there doing the same kind of thing, which is, how is it, how is it that this is so clear to me? And you're not seeing it, right? And that forces you to be creative and come up with lots of different ways to explain things. Um, so it felt the same, except there was no anger, right? Because if, if they don't understand it, they're not going to take my property away. So you know, it wasn't quite uh, as tense. And so what I found out by doing this, what I hadn't known before is what are we doing when we do mathematics? So what we're doing actually is we're doing deduction and that's applied to concepts like numbers and shapes and functions and sets, okay? And the thing that I had missed all along is that the premises you start with are arbitrary, right? Now this is not something that I think is widely taught in schools where you're just, look, one plus one is two because if I take two apples and put them together, that's two, that's the way it is, that's math, right? And so what I had to figure out by explaining to other people is that math is not about the world, math is a purely formal system. It, there's nothing about the world that tells you what is necessarily going to be going on with math. The premises are arbitrary. And so what I came to understand about deduction is this, deduction cannot tell you what is true. Deduction can tell you what is consistent with a set of premises or inconsistent with a set of premises that you chose. You don't go out and dig these up out of the ground. You don't pick them off trees. You choose your premises. And different, in different areas of math, you can choose different premises. And so the, the key insight for me was that when you say things like, you know, two plus two is four, there is a giant if then in front of that, right? Which is, okay, if we define zero and one this way, and if we take the piano axioms, and if we define these operations, and if, and if, and if, and if then, two plus two equals four. Now, we never say that stuff, you know, because you would never get through anything if every statement had to be prefaced this way. So you tend to not say it, but it's always there. And the problem is, that when you're being taught this, uh, just as a quick reality check, how many of you were taught that in school? That, that all of these things are conditional. This is two plus two equals four. No, that's it, right? It's as opposed to, okay, so you, know, you can see what kind of coverage we're getting there. Um, so, and you start seeing this because you look at things like this, right? So I ask, you know, well, what, what's the sum of the angles in a triangle? And everybody knows because you saw it proved 180, right? 180 degrees, right? Except look at the triangle on the right. It's on a sphere. It's not on a flat piece of paper. The sum of those angles is 270 degrees. So how can both of those be right? Okay. And to take a simpler one for people who hate geometry, which is pretty much everybody who went to public school, right? Um, you look at something like this. What's 8 plus 5? Okay, if I'm adding cookies, it's 13. But if I start at 8 o'clock and I wait 5 hours, it's 1 o'clock. And if I wait another 24 hours, 12 hours, it's one o'clock again, right? How can both of those answers be right? And the answer is, it's because you're not talking about the same thing. You're talking about two completely different things, okay? And the fact that one of them is right does not make the other one wrong if it's based on different premises. So what was happening here is my conception of truth had changed. What I thought of as, you know, when you say something is true, that had changed for me, okay? Um, and that meant my conception of what an argument was had changed, right? So before you would walk around and say things like, or I'd walk around and say things like, you know, well, people own themselves and it's the purpose of government to protect individual rights and, 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 and therefore taxes are theft, right? And then you wonder why people don't, like, why, why aren't you just bowing at my feet and saying, oh, thank you for clearing this up, right? Afterwards, my conception of an argument was, 
if people own themselves, and if the purpose of government is to protect rights, and if, and if, and if, and if, then taxes are theft. Now, just like with those problems, they, those use the same symbols. They use a lot of the same words. They have the same sort of structure. From across the room, they look the same, but they could not be more different. Um, and so the, the change for me was where I used to see truth, I now saw only consequences. Okay? And I never, ever would have noticed this, let alone understood it, if I had not stumbled into this job by blind luck. So I didn't have a particular aha moment. There was no you know, moment that I could just think back and point to. But um, what I noticed that was that even though I wasn't doing a lot of arguing myself, when I would hear other people doing, arguing about freedom and about liberty, my reaction was changing. Right? So I would hear the kinds of arguments I used to make, and instead of be like, yeah, yeah, I'd be like, okay, that's, that's one way to look at it. There are others, <laughs> you know? Um, and that was when I realized I had been religious. I had had the religion of liberty, but I wasn't religious anymore. This had all happened. I stumbled in and stumbled back out without actually knowing what was going on. And so what do I mean by that? Well, if you, you actually just, you know, I like words. I like definitions. I'm a mathematician. That's what we do. You look up religion, and it says it's a system of faith. And you look up faith, and it says it's complete trust. Okay. And so, to me now, what makes you religious is not that you believe in God or gods. It's that you have one set of premises, and you cannot conceive that another one could be possible, let alone correct. Okay. And what happened to me after that is I, I stopped defining, to me, libertarian no longer meant somebody who you know, believes in the non-aggression principle. To me now, a libertarian is somebody who takes seriously the idea that I could be wrong. Okay? Because if I could be wrong, then I really have no business telling you how to live your life. Okay? That to me now is the core of libertarianism. That ability to just say, you know what? <laughs> I'll, I'll do what I think is right, you do what you think is right, and we don't, and there's no way for us to even know or assign the concept of truth to either of those. And what I noticed after this, by the way, was a, a form of argument that began to actually kind of drive me nuts. And it sounds like this. You hear people saying, and I'm going to guess, if you go out and start listening for this, you will hear this at least a dozen times over the next day or so. You will hear people saying, you cannot even argue with blank. You cannot even argue with the non-aggression principle. You cannot even argue with self-ownership. And it's like, okay, first of all, yes, you can. And second, if you just choose different premises, it's not even a matter of argument. It's just, we're not even talking about the same thing. So that's my story. So what does this have to do with you? Um, so do any of you, have, you ever, any of you ever heard of Erhard Seminars Training? Heard of sort of, it. You've heard of it. It's sort of a cult from the 1970s. But they had one spectacularly good idea. Est, sorry, yeah, Est. You may have heard it called that Est. Sorry, yeah. So they had one spectacularly good idea, which is if you're going to be involved in a relationship, and that could be parent-child, it could be husband-wife, it could be friends, it could be teacher-student, it could just be two people meeting to talk, okay? You're in a relationship. You have to know what your agreements are. This is the central premise of Est. And so, my understanding now became this. If I'm going to try to persuade somebody about liberty, we have to make some agreements, and we have to know what our agreements are. And the first agreement we have to make is, are we going to use deduction, or are we going to use something else? Now, deduction is not the only way to, con to con conduct an argument. It's not the only way to convince somebody. Just look at advertising. You see hundreds of, of ways to persuade people of things that have absolutely nothing to do with reason to logical argument. However, you know, for most of us, we think of deduction, a, a logical argument, as what we're, we're trying to do. We're trying to convince somebody of something, and we're trying to lay it out in a way that you have an airtight case. So to recap, deduction means you start with some premises, and you follow them wherever they take you. Um, there's a set of conclusions that will logically follow. The case everybody knows is Socrates is a man. All men are mortal. Therefore, Socrates is mortal. And it doesn't matter, really, whether, for instance, those are true. Maybe Socrates wasn't a man. Maybe he was an alien. Or maybe men are sometimes immortal, right? It doesn't matter. For purposes of deduction, we accept those as true. 
and then the conclusion follows from it. Now, uh, that's the theory. And in theory, theory and practice are the same, but in practice, as we all know, they're different. And it turns out in practice, the more common sense that you can try to apply to the subject being discussed, or the more emotion it brings up, the less you are able to pay attention to the form of the argument. And what this means in principle is, this is one of the reasons deductive discussions, deductive arguments do not often work when you're talking about an emotionally charged issue like gun control or homeschooling or whatever your favorite issue is. Um, and so, you know, in a sense, the way I think of it is experience drowns out deduction, okay? Now, there are ways to get around this in academia to prevent this. They do everything just in terms of abstract statements, P, Q, R, S, right? But, you know, people can't juggle that stuff. They can't keep this in their heads, which is one of the reasons people have trouble with algebra, right? X, what's X supposed to be? I can't do this unless I know what X is. Lewis Carroll, interestingly, got around this, uh, and he was a logician in, a, in addition to being a, an author, a children's author. He got around this by making all his premises sort of nonsensical but using everyday terms so you could at least sort of picture things in your head. And so a, a typical Lewis Carroll syllogism would be something like, um, no ducks play golf. Uh, do I have one? Yeah, no ducks play golf. Or, uh, wait just a second. All ducks play golf, nobody who's a, who plays golf is a dentist, therefore no duck is a dentist, right? And so you can listen to that, and, and you can sort of picture in your mind, here's some ducks, they're playing golf, none of them are dentists, all the dentists are over here, so right, no dentist plays golf, you can actually follow that. But the nonsense part of it is nice because it gets you to sort of give up your idea that you, <laughs> nothing that you know about duck, ducks or dentists or golf is even relevant here. So there's no temptation for you to try to reason about this any other way except deductively. Um, so anyways, that's deduction. That's the first agreement you have to make. Deduction, something else. The second agreement you have to make is a little trickier, and that is, are you gonna be consistent or are you gonna be complete? So does anybody already know what those terms mean? Okay, so if you haven't and you want to actually understand this, I can recommend a marvelous book called Go to Lesher Bach by Douglas Hofstadter. And it's a big fat book, it's really intimidating. Here's the thing, you don't have, you can read just the dialogues, okay? Seriously, this is one of those Pareto's rule thing where 20% of the book gives you more than 80% of the content. So I'm going to simplify it this way. If we are, if, if you have a consistent set of premises, it means that if you can prove something, and by prove, I mean you can construct a chain of reasoning that leads to it, you know it's true. Here's the catch. There will always be things that are true that you cannot prove, and you can't know ahead of time what they are. Okay, so in law, this is known as a loophole, right? Oh, there's got to be some way that we can keep them from doing this, but we can't find it. Maybe it's not there. So on the other hand, completeness means if something, if something is true, you can always prove it. You can always find some set of steps that will take you to that. Again, there is a catch. If you have a complete set of premises, not only can you prove things that are true, you can also prove things that are false. In other words, you can prove anything you want. You can prove you know, that it rained yesterday, and you can prove that it didn't rain yesterday. You can prove that this guy is guilty. You can prove that he's innocent, right? So in, in some sense, deduction with completeness isn't the concept of proof goes away and it's replaced by rationalization. Um, so, then there's a third agreement you have to make, right? So, agreeing on consistency, agreeing on deduction and consistency gets you in the same ballpark. You still have to have the same premises. That's how you know you're playing the same game. Otherwise, you know, you're, it, uh, you lay out your argument and you think, yeah, I've won, and it's really like you ran onto a baseball field and said, ah, I scored a touchdown, right? <laughs> Different game, really not effective. Um, and so, you know, you have to keep in mind, right, if you are using different premises, you can get different answers to the same question, and the fact that one is wrong, or one is right, doesn't make the other one wrong. So, to summarize, you know, deduction is a machine, and you drop premises in, and you turn a crank, and conclusions come out, but you have to have something to start with. Right? So where does that come from? The premises that you start from do not depend on anything else, and it's hard to overemphasize how critical that is. If you find yourself trying to justify or explain a premise, here's what that means, it's not a premise. The thing you're using to justify it 
is your premise. And as you do that, one of the things you find out is that a premise is what a guru like uh, Stephen Covey, for instance, would say uh, is a value. A premise expresses what you want to be true, what is important to you. It does not express anything about the world. And it certainly doesn't express anything about what somebody else should be finding important or unimportant. So every once in a while, I won't name any names, but you find people who will say that they can find some universal set of premises. We, this is the universal set and we should all start from this. And really what they're saying is we should all have the same, we should all value everything the same way and with the same priority, right? And so first of all, no. And second, it's not clear you'd want to even live in a world like that where everybody <laughs> had exactly the same values. It's kind of creepy to even think about. <laughs> yeah, the, the what? <laughs> um, so everybody knows this joke, how do you get to Carnegie Hall practice, right? But there's a deeper meaning here, and, and that is that the answer to this question depends on where you are. If you're in a street corner in New York City, you get one kind of answer. If you're in New Hampshire, that's a very different answer. If you're in Los Angeles or Paris or on Mars, that answer is completely different, right? And so sort of the central thing about trying to convince somebody of anything is if you want somebody to move from their point of view to another point of view, you have to go to where they are, okay? So I teach Wing Chun Kung Fu and we make use of this principle, which is let's say somebody is attacking me and what I would like to do is make them run into the podium, <laughs> okay? I want to use that as a weapon instead of my fist. What I don't do is step away from them and try to guide them from the outside. What I do is get close to them so now we are moving together and that makes it much easier to take them where I want them to go. So the same thing applies to argumentation, right? And there's a, I've been trying to find this reference for years now. I read something, a, a book by a psychotherapist and he said, when you want to really get somebody to change, what you have to do is enter their delusion so that you can bring them back out of it, right? So the way that you enter somebody's delusion is instead of forcing your premises on them, you accept their premises and show that they lead to someplace you don't want to go. So how do you do this? The main trick is called modus tollens. This is a basic rule of logic. And I mean, so again, we see the P's and Q's, right? Um, and what this means is if you have, if you start as a premise that whenever P is Q, P is true, Q is true, and then you show that Q is not true, you know that P isn't true, okay? Very, very basic, and in fact, this is the basis of the scientific method, right? So here's an example from science. If Newton's law of gravity is correct, then light won't be bent when it passes near the sun. That's P implies Q. However, light is bent when it passes near the sun, so not Q, therefore not P. Newton's laws of gravity are wrong, okay? This is how science works. You actually get your premises, your theory is your set of premises, you make some predictions, and when they disagree with experiment, you have to go back and change your premises. You just change um, the data points in your experiment. Sure, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's another way to handle it. Um, <laughs> yeah, it, it depends on what your goals are, really. Um, so that's, that's the scientific method, right? So Emerson said once that the fox has many tricks and the hedgehog has one really good one, okay? Socrates, in addition to being a man and mortal, was also a hedgehog in the sense that what he did in almost all of Plato's dialogues is the same trick. He would just be sitting there, you know, having a good time. Some guy wanders by and essentially what he said, although he never expressed it this way, is, hey buddy, make up a premise, okay? The way he would ask it, of course, would be something like, what do you think justice is? And the guy would give an answer, right? He'd say something like, oh, well, I think justice is when the weak can triumph over the strong. And Socrates would go, oh, well, that's kind of interesting. So if a bunch of weaker people get together and kill a stronger guy and take his property, that's justice? And of course the guy would go, well, okay, no, uh, that's, <clears throat> that's not exactly what I meant. So I'd better withdraw that premise, right? It's the same thing that's going on in science. Um, you know, the big difference, of course, is with science, you then go back and do a whole review of, if I <laughs> substitute a different premise, did I screw anything else up? Something that doesn't happen most of the time when people are just discussing things or when lawyers or, or judges are inventing things. So in Wing Chun, we also have, in Wing Chun Kung Fu, we also have this uh, idea. We actually, there's a physical implementation of this, which is if somebody is trying to hit me, there are a few things I can do. One is I move out of the way and let it go past me. Another is I stay where I am and I deflect it. But sort of the most fun one is when the punch or kick comes in, you actually add your own energy to it. 
And what that means is a person who thought a punch was going to go this far finds it goes a foot farther and now he's off balance. And okay. So it's when somebody's lost his balance that you can most easily move him. Okay? The people who invented Wing Chun knew that. Socrates knew that. And for me, if there is one secret to persuasion, this is it. So I'll repeat it again. It's when somebody is off balance that he can be moved most easily. So, you know, looking back, it seemed like that was what I was doing already. And I, you know, I think a lot of you probably recognize this. You're like, no, 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 I did. I did that. I did exactly that. I took something that they believed and I made it seem ridiculous. And so, and it didn't work. And so, if I had been doing this and I'd had an EST trainer standing behind my shoulder whispering in my ear, he would have said this. He, said, he would have said, did you agree to deduction? Did you agree to consistency? Did you agree on a set of premises? And of course, I, I hadn't done any of those things, which is why I'm screaming at the screen, right? <laughs> Thinking, why are you, you know, what kind of idiot are you guys? So I have a theory, I developed a theory after this, which is that there are two kinds of people in the world. And you can divide them up based on their reaction to this kind of modus tollens um, thing. So to take an example, just so we have something to think with, you know, here's an argument that you might find somebody making, right? If you have the right to self-defense, then you have the right to keep and bear arms, because it's, you know, meaningless without that. And convicted felons have a right to self-defense, and therefore convicted felons have a right to keep and bear arms. And you tell that to people, and most people have the predictable reaction, which is like, no, no, we can't have that, so we'd better go back and change a premise, right? We'd better go back and say something like, uh, convicted felons don't have the right to self-defense, or uh, by self-defense we mean that you can use pointed sticks, or, right? So they'll, they'll go back and make that change. Um, and, you know, this is, in fact, if you were ever wondering exactly how you end up with things like judges uh, interpreting the people or all persons in New Hampshire to mean the people minus convicted felons and, you know, casual drug users and whoever else we want to throw out of there. Um, and this, when you hear it, is a desire, is an expression of the desire for completeness. They just can't deal with the idea that there might be an unpleasant conclusion that they can't outlaw, okay? So that's a big clue. And if somebody, even if they agree to deduction and consistency and you find them doing this, it means they didn't really agree. They're holding back. And if you find somebody wearing a robe with a gavel, that is a huge clue that it is this kind of person. Um, but there's a second kind of response that you can have, which I, I personally hardly ever run into, but it's refreshing when you do. And that is for the person to say, okay, yeah, <laughs> I, don't, I don't like that conclusion, but it doesn't invalidate the premise, right? I, I still believe that everybody has the right to self-defense, and we'll just have to find a way to deal with that, right? That there are some people who will just say, look, I chose my premises because I believe in them, and I will, take the, I will go where they take me, right? So those are the more interesting people, I think, to have discussions with. It's a lot less frustrating. But a lot of times there's really, you'll find that you agree on things or, you know, there's, there's not that much to fight about. Um, so as I said, science also, I don't want to give the impression, by the way, that this kind of backtracking is always bad. As I pointed out, science depends on this. And as I, I pointed out, the difference is in science, you don't simply add new premises, you replace them, which means you take the, the old ones out and you put the new ones in, which keeps your set of premises small. Because the way that you move from a consistent set of premises to a complete set of premises is you just keep adding premises. And eventually, two of them will conflict, you'll get a contradiction, then you're done. Because from, from any contradiction, you can prove anything. So, um, anyways. I'm going to give you a tip, something that helped me a lot. Um, so whenever anybody asks me a question about any emotionally charged issue, which is almost everything in politics, the first thing I say is, it depends. And I say this without even knowing what I'm going to say it depends on. Okay, I, I'm going to come up with that in a minute. Um, and I do this for two reasons. And the first reason is that it gives me a chance to sort of take a breath, and think about what I want to say as opposed to whatever my reaction would be. 
And those of you who are familiar with something called the Alexander Technique will actually realize this is an implementation of that. It's a way of replacing reactions with actions. Um, but the second thing is it reminds me that whatever my answer is going to be does depend on something. It depends on my values, right? Ultimately, anything, any answer I give is going to depend on what I personally think is important. And that also reminds me that the other person is going to value different things or may value different things, okay? And so the, the benefit of that is it takes a lot of the stress out of this. You, and, and in particular, you don't walk away feeling like, oh, God, another idiot. You know, it's just, well, there's a guy who values different things than me. So what's my goal here today? I mean, thank you for coming and listening to me ramble, but I actually do have a goal. And the goal is really to get people to stop wasting time and energy on discussions that cannot come to any useful conclusion, right? Um, and I hope that, you know, af my hope af is after today, you might have a little better idea of how it is that you get into those situations, why they occur, how to tell when you're in one. And if you find that you're in one, there are at least three things that you can do about it. One is you agree to disagree, right? You talk about something else or you just say, see ya, you go work on something uh, more productive. The second thing, which is in some sense my favorite, is to back up and instead of talking about the issue that you're sort of butting heads on, is take a step up and talk about how did you get your premises? What are your premises, in fact? How did you get them? Were they just given to you by your parents? Or did you just adopt them because the people around you did? If you had been born in China or Iran or Africa, would you have different premises? And what does that tell you about how tightly you should be holding on to these things? And in particular, I love discussions about consistency and completeness because that is the fork in the road where you decide we are either going to have the rule of law or we are going to have something else, whatever that is. Um, so then the third thing is you can discuss what I call the resource problem, okay? And the resource problem to me is in some sense the only really interesting problem in politics which is this. Given that you have all these people disagreeing on premises and just they're never going to come to any kind of serious agreement about what to do or how to do it. If you are in the situation where some of those people have premises that require some of the other people to be used as a resource, namely, I, I need your property, I need your time, I need your expertise, maybe eventually I'll need your kidney, right? At some point, as with any form of organized crime, you go along with it as a compromise, and then at some point it's too much. And when it gets to be too much, you are either going to have to fight or do something else. And so for me, the most interesting thing to be discussing really is, what are those something else's that we should be considering? How are we going to avoid killing each other because we value different things? So to sum up, what made me religious was that I didn't realize for a long time that there was this big if-then in front of everything coming out of my mouth. I thought I was starting from the one true set of premises, and that meant I wasn't arguing, I was proselytizing. Not that there's anything wrong with that. You know, it's good to be clear about what you're doing. Um, and so what I was doing is pretty much the same thing that these guys are doing, and I was not surprisingly getting pretty similar results. Um, and I will close with a, a, a story that my wife told me recently. She was having uh, lunch with a friend, and they started talking and they got onto the subject of the recent wars that the United States has been involved in and they immediately like, right, we should not be in these wars. This is just a big mistake. But as they started talking about details, they found they were butting heads on almost every individual point. And at some point, as, you know, her friend stopped and he said, wait a minute, I think we're starting from different premises. I think the government should be doing all this stuff and you think people should have control. Why don't we talk about something else? And they did. This is my dream, <laughs> and this is what I wish for all of you in your discussions about politics. So, thank you for listening. No questions? Yes? To what extent, uh, I don't know if you're read them, but to what extent, uh, if any, did uh, writings of Benjamin Tucker and Orbe Schiffer? I have not read them at all. 
I'm coming at this from as a mathematician. I'm not really well read in political philosophy, honestly. Um, this is just my take of, on things largely as somebody who uh, has had to explain a lot of mathematics and somebody who loves language. So, but, uh, I mean, what would you have seen that... I haven't read much of Benjamin Tucker. I come to the same, same process that you have, and I recently discovered that, that he had these same types of thoughts. He originally was a natural life, uh, rights person. He became acquainted with Max Stirner, and he changes it. So he comes to, and he changes Stirner's thinking a little bit. But I think that if you were to look at his, his work, he'll come to it, because the whole concept of natural rights basically kind of basically depends upon having the same premises. And if you don't have the same premises, then those a bunch of uh, solutions are, are thrown out. Right, yeah. And you know the same thing of agreeing, you know, as far as the same type of process, the like reasoning and stuff like that. Um, because if you go back to your slide, uh, I don't know if you can do it real quickly, but if you go back to your slide, as far as you start with the premises, yeah, I, I approached it from you approach it from the top down. I approach mm -hmm. it the, the other direction. And I'm just curious if you were to flip that diagram around, you see, you, you approach it from both angles, really. But if you flip it around the other way, you come up with a different, a different process. Um, I don't think so, uh, because you still have to answer those questions. You still have to answer, am I interested in consistency or completeness? You still have to answer, am I going to use deduction or something else? For me, no matter what you, the, the, the thing, you know, I used to, I read some about natural rights, and it always seemed to me, yes, this is obvious, this is true. What, uh, what else could it be? And the point I'm making here now is, that doesn't look like that to me anymore. This is okay, says you. Right? <laughs> there are other people who have completely different conceptions of how things work that don't involve anything like individual rights. And the most you can say is, you and I are playing a different game. Right? And so that is what I mean by the, the anger goes away. It's not so much that I'm looking at them thinking, you're an idiot. Right? This, this stuff is true. Look, we can do an experiment that shows that natural rights exist, because, you know, you can't. So I, I think the order... Um, I, I think I ordered them, any order would work, I ordered them that way because those are sort of the quickest ways for me to, to just say, okay, we're done, we have nothing more to talk about. You know, if you're not interested in deduction, we're done. If you're not interested in consistency, we're done. Oh, you're interested in those? Now we can talk about premises, right? So I would, it, it's a way, ordering it that way is really just a way of sort of cutting down the amount of work that you'd have to do. Yes? I mean, this is a, we were talking earlier, I mentioned that as people are kind of projects, we had these kind of discussions. And, and we understood our premises were different, we kind of investigated that. There's two things. One is, we ne I never really thought about the whole deduction or something else or consistency or not. It was sort of assumed, which is not good. <laughs> and uh, the other thing was, is it's, uh, it can be tricky figuring out what the premises actually are. And people don't know about it without at least a lot of discussion or discussion or something. Right, and that's why I suggest that you can, instead of fighting about education or gun control or whatever, talk about your premises. Figure out what they are. And it's not like everybody walks around and has them on a piece of paper that they can pull out and say, here are my premises, right? It does take work, but those are fascinating discussions to find out what's the basic thing. And, and one that, like, I was talking to some people earlier today, and, you know, they, they'll, they'll start with something that they think is a premise. It's like, well, I, I, I believe in the sanctity of life. And it's like, is that really a premise? Because, well, why do you believe in it? Well, I believe in it because, you know, it's something that's given freely or whatever. It's like, oh, so if it were developed in a test tube, then it's okay? You can kill a test tube baby? And she's like, oh, I don't know, right? You are exactly right. It takes work to figure out what your premises are, but that is interesting work, and it's work worth doing. Yes. Yeah, I, uh, I add a, a choice at the top of your chart, okay? Mm -hmm. And that is, what kind of a conversation are we going to have? Are we going to have a question about opinions? You know, hey, what about that sports team, in you know, short sports team here? Or what do you think of that movie, blah, 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 blah. Or are we going to talk about what's true? Okay. Now, if they want to talk about opinions, great. We'll sit there and talk about, you know, stars and blah, blah, blah. What do you think about stuff? You know, ice cream flavors. But if they want to talk about what's true, that's like, okay, well, we need a methodology to find out what's true. Are we going to use, there's only two methods that I know of that people use to define the truth. One is logic, reason, evidence. And the other is because I said so. 
Oh, right? there are lots of them, though. <laughs> There's divine uh, intervention, for example. Well, but that's because I said so. God said so. Mm, not quite the same. They that are. In their mind, that is not okay, the same. Okay, well, see, I invite right. them to say, do you know of any others? Okay. There's majority rule. Some people think of that as a mechanism. Some people think of majority rule as a, a mechanism for determining truth. The will but of the people must be correct. But majority rule I mean, uh, if, if we because, wanted to, we right. could sit here for 20 minutes, right. and I'm guessing we could come up with a dozen ways. Yeah. But, but that, I think yeah. most of those boil down to because I said so. And so right, right. And, and I'm specifically here talking, you're right, yeah. and there are certain conversations where this doesn't matter. Yeah. I'm specifically specifically talking about persuasive conversations where I'm trying to move somebody to a perspective yeah. where liberty seems like a better idea. But yeah, if they won't go with logic, reason, and evidence, your deduction, then it's like, okay, we're right. with opinions because I'm not going to talk about the truth with that. Right. Um, you, Yeah, I, I come up, you know, you talk about trying to find the common ground there to the, the premises. And to me, you know, history, human nature, the nature of government, economics, and, and what happens with me is the people I talk to, they just ignore all that. All they have is their own notions in their head. And I'm the idiot chasing them around the book. Well, look at this economics book. Uh, look at this history book. And, and because I'll get into discussions with people and obviously they involved in arguments or whatever. And I come back and I'm like, I'm trying to, I'm walking around with books. You know, yeah. I'm just so, you know, basic economics or, oh, here's Bosch, yeah, I read this thing about what used to, how it used to happen. And, Right, history. And yeah. you can't get to the point where you have premises because everyone's like, uh, well, I just have my own notions in my head, and I'm just going to oh. go up. Yeah. And you can actually ask, I mean, you can have a discussion where you ask them to articulate that, right? And you're essentially playing Socrates there. And it's like, well, what? tell me something you think is true, right? Or just not even something you think is true, something that you would not let anybody talk you out of. And you, you have to dig, like, like Tony was pointing out, this is, it's work, right? But you're going to make a lot more progress, and both of you are going to learn something from that as opposed to simply saying, here's another book to read, or you're wrong because you don't understand that God gave me this right to do something, okay? So that's, I'm just saying shift the discussion. You can still talk, right? And in case this wasn't clear, I think I, I may have glossed over this a little too quickly, it's critical to understand that if somebody starts with a set of premises, I have premises one, two, three, four, and five, and you simply add premise six to that, it doesn't change anything. Because I can still reach all the conclusions that I could reach before. That doesn't work. This is why in science I said you have to take away a premise before you add another one. And this is a lot of work to actually find. You cannot this is also what I meant by being off balance. You have to get the person to realize that something that they would have said 10 minutes ago is absolutely true is maybe not. Okay. Right. So that's modus tollens, which is also hard. Again, as soon as there's emotion involved and they have, you know, oh, this is just the way I see the world and this is what I think is going on. Well, I see it. Sometimes I can see certain people's, people I talk to on a regular basis. I see the trigger and, and I know they're emotionally shot. Yeah. Like you say, at that point I have to stop because nothing can reach a minute. Right, yes. <laughs> Go, you know, one of the things that you can, yeah. They're getting emotionally right. shot, there's no longer discussion. Right. There's no longer ability to comprehend, right. they just lost it. Go work on your marksmanship. <laughs> <laughs> Why is everybody laughing? <laughs> um, was there another question? Oh, yeah. Do you have a YouTube channel? Actually, I do right now. It's Holden Caulfield. I, this, this whole public speaking thing is new to me. I used to like not even let people take my picture. There are no pictures of me from like 1994 to 2013. <laughs> it's the YouTube channel is Holden Caulfield. Right. So the way to find it actually is to go and search for Hogwarts Law. Because uh, at Last Liberty Forum, I did a, uh, an Ignite. An Ignite talk where I talked about uh, basically why law is no longer possible. And it's the, it was the Hogwarts School of Law was the thing. Oh, so yeah, if you, I that was awesome. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so yeah. if you search for Hogwarts Law, Ian Underwood, you'll find it. Uh, I apologize for not having it more organized, um, but yeah, I'm working on that. Okay. Yes. Have you ever read a guy named Robert Piercy? He talks a lot about uh, values. He wrote a book called Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. Oh, Robert Piercy. Yeah, I love that book. Yeah, um, 
he says, and I think most good empiricists would say, that there is a source. There's a very good source of values, and that's experience. And then until our experience is all the same, our values will be the same. So probably we're never going to live in a world where everybody's values are exactly the same. Do you agree? Yeah, yeah I, I totally agree, and I, I agree partly because your values are shaped by your experiences. Nobody's going to have the same set of experiences. That's why you can have identical twins who will grow up and they'll have a lot of things in common, but there will be some things they'll disagree on. Uh, Robert Pearson wrote a book called Lila. You probably find very I, I have not read yeah, that. It's um, really good. Okay. The name of the book is Lila, L-I-L-A, Robert Pearson. Okay. okay. All I know about that is that he was disappointed. I remember reading that he was disappointed that it didn't get a better reception, and so I was like, okay, maybe it's not that good. But, uh, no, it's, uh, it's really know? good. If you like the first okay. book, it's, it's, thought, it's the nuts and bolts from I thought it was better than that. Yeah. Oh, okay. That's quite a recommendation then, so I will be sure to look at that. Yeah. When you talk about the same premises, if you have more than one premise, are the premises equally weighted, equally integrated, or can they be orderly? If, if you're doing deduction, all premises have equal rank. Um, what you may have, though, are some premises, and this is something I, t I talk a lot about constitutions and why the constitution is basically screwed from day one. Um, the, the issue there is you can have a premise that says when two things come into conflict, prefer one, right? And so that's, if, so for example, if you have a premise that says the purpose of government is to protect individual rights, and you also have a premise that says the purpose of government is to promote the general welfare. Okay, at that point, <laughs> you're a judge, you can do anything, right? And, and it doesn't even matter. We're not even talking about stare decisis. We're not talking about, you know, redefining words. Right from day one, you can do anything you want. There is no such thing as an unconstitutional law. Um, but what you could do then, you could remove one of those and remove the contradiction, or you could put in a premise that says, you could write them differently. You could say, for example, the purpose of government is to protect individual rights insofar as we can still promote the general welfare, or the purpose is to promote the general welfare insofar as we can protect rights. And that assigns a clear priority. So it's one of the things you can do. Um, but generally, I mean, it, a set of premises is a system. So that's it. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much.